So, <clears throat> we have one more speaker before our break. Um, and this is going to be very interesting. I've been sitting back there watching her rewrite her, her lecture uh, five or six times. And the comfy chair is back there. So, Robin Welsh is our next speaker. Robin is a practicing attorney here in Monterey County. She's the person who found this venue for us. Uh, she has a particular interest in the church state issues. And when not in the, when not in the courtroom, she can be found playing Irish tunes on the fiddle or taking in live music or theater events or playing Candy Crush on her phone. <laughs> Sorry. It's true. <laughs> I didn't say no. Robin's first pet was an orange tabby cat named Percy, and she's a little upset that I asked her that because that went, her secure, went one of her security questions. <laughs> so forget I said that. Percy, P-E-R-C-E-Y. <laughs> she will be talking to us today not so much about the Polit much politics, but about Supreme Court decisions concerning church and state. She's going to define the difference between establishment and free exercise. At least that's what I thought at the beginning, but like I said, this has changed a few times, so that's fine. I'm cool with that, and welcome Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, no, I've decided to talk about politics. <laughs> Um, some of you may have noticed that there's kind of a Christian nationalist movement in this country. Oh, really? oh. <laughs> um, sometimes some people call it Dominion Theology. Some, there's some different names for it, but. Um, okay, I'll try to be closer. I'm, I'm afraid of making that funny noise with the microphone. Um, and they argue that the founding fathers uh, did not intend to erect a wall. Uh, between church and state in this country. And they think that the United States should be a Christian nation. Uh, never mind that there are exactly zero secular historians who share this view. That doesn't matter. But they have a lot of websites. Um, and sometimes their websites are difficult to recognize um, because they have kind of confusing titles and confusing names. But they tend to use certain giveaway words that you can recognize, like scripture, for example. When I see the word scripture, I think I'm dealing with a religious person. So I think it's useful to have a certain amount of literacy in this area so we can develop some tools uh, to maybe recognize what their arguments are and how we can rebut them. And I got the idea to do this talk one day when I was Googling. There's a particular guy, have you heard of David Barton? <coughs> Everybody's probably heard of David Barton. He's one of the main guys who writes these websites and he's written some books about the Founding Fathers and why they are Christian and why they intended us just to be a Christian nation. And I googled the words David Barton debunked. And I found just a treasure trove of rational argument. And I thought this is, this is a skeptic's tool that we should all use all the time. If I see something fishy, I google that thing plus the word debunked. And a lot of times you don't have to do the investigation yourself, somebody else has already done it and it's up on the web and all you have to do is read their rational argument and there you go. So, I'm going to go into a few of the, um, the things that David Barton asserts and try to debunk them. Um, one of the arguments he puts forward is that there's a case, United States Supreme Court, Supreme Court case from 1892 called Holy Trinity Church versus U.S. and there was a uh, an opinion written by Justice David Brewer, and he said, unfortunately, I'm going to quote him, these and many other matters which might be noticed add a volume of unofficial declarations to the mass of organic utterances that this is a Christian nation. So first of all, this case was not a religion case at all. It was an overbroadness case. Sometimes the Supreme Court uh, they, they, there are certain categories of cases. Vagueness, overbroadness is a law. Overbroad in that it brings in too many people. Is it vague in that nobody can really understand what the law says? This was, a, this was an overbroadness case. So it happened to be a church suing the federal government, but that was kind of a coincidence. And David Brewer himself, it was kind of an offhand comment as part of his argument. He was just making a general observation about society. And he later wrote a book in 1905, and he expressed his regret about those words that he said, and he said, among other things, I'll quote him, government is 
and must remain independent of all religions. So, back to the Founding Fathers. You know, our Founding Fathers were children of the Enlightenment, and they believed, they universal, universally believed that reason is the method that we should use to solve social problems and to determine the role of government in society. Um, the Founding Fathers were very well educated about the recent European history, that European history that their parents and grandparents had fled, involving the church having a lot of power and different sects of Christianity um, coming into conflict with each other, and even civil wars between uh, Protestants and Catholics. And so they really, the Founding Fathers were charged with writing a constitution and creating a new nation, and they wanted to avoid those problems. And they were very adamant about it. So let's excuse me, start with the Declaration of Independence. Which button do I push? Oops. Okay. <clears throat> Declaration of Independence. So uh, David Barton and some of his followers and people, um, they, they think that the Declaration of Independence supports an argument that, that God and government are inseparable because, because it begins by saying we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator, with certain inalienable rights, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes on to say that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, not from God. So I think the, um, the rebuttal to that argument is contained in the very same sentence that they used to argue in favor of God. Does it actually say not from God? Or is no, that I put that, that in. <laughs> so, so it's implied. Huh? So you're implying. Yeah, well, it just says what it says. I mean, I end quote there after deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And I infer that to mean not from God. From the consent of the governed. <coughs> and of course, that's in the historical background of kings considered basically the emissary of the head of the church as an enemy from uh, yes, absolutely. Royalty and uh, other countries being traceable in their authority back to the Pope. Yeah. And that was the history of the time. They didn't have to say it, not think about it. It may have been obvious. I think uh, it was obvious to them. <clears throat> but it, it, isn't, isn't that the problem with like legalese that's so vague that everyone, every lawyer can have their own separate interpretation of the same sentence? Well, I think a lot of scholars have addressed the words of the founding fathers. So I don't, I don't know if that. It's a lot of archaic language. I don't know if it's legalese so much. People uh, don't really realize. A lot of people don't realize the Declaration of Independence has zero legal impact. No, but it's part of the history. It is part True, of our but history. But in terms of yes, the Constitution. So after the Declaration of Independence, but before the Constitution, Thomas Jefferson was in the uh, Virginia Legislature, and he he uh, introduced a bill. Um, and he called it a bill establishing religious freedom, but he wrote to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. In the same document, he said, uh, he used the words Almighty God, and he also used the words Holy Author of Our Religion, which I think has been turned around. But I kind of wonder if he used that language because maybe he, he was trying to politically appeal to his Congress to pass this law, and he was saying, you know, this is what I think our religion dictates and um, maybe what God wants, let's say. Um, in 19, 1784 and 1785, Virginia was still trying to pass a tax for the benefit of religious teachers, and that triggered another famous document by the Founding Fathers, James Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance, in which he wrote, who does not see at the same authority which can force a citizen to contribute three pence only of his property for the support of any one establishment may force him to conform to any other establishment in all cases whatsoever. Well, that is legalese. That's called the slippery slope argument. <laughs> um, he also said that religion, or the duty that we owe the creator, is not within the cognizance of civil government 
that's in the same document, yes? But particularly in the New England states, at the same time, there was a requirement for I'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> from, that from that last quote, it seems, it seems evident to me that the Founding Fathers had no trouble identifying both as religious, but also wanting a secular government. They were religious, we can't deny that. Um, James Madison in this document said, religion, or the duty we owe the creator, was not within the cognizance of civil government. Um, you know, there are so many things that the founding fathers didn't know back then. And, and I, you know, Richard Dawkins talks about the God of the Gaps, but the gaps were huge in 1776. You know, they didn't know that viruses caused disease. They didn't know that that little cloud of dust we call Andromeda is another galaxy and one of trillions. Um, they, they were, you know, the gaps were huge then. And so, um, I don't fault them for, you know, society at that time filled the, go the gaps with God, and that's, that's just the way society was. So then, um, next up, the Federalist Papers are another uh, Founding Father document that the religious right likes to point to to say, oh, well, the Federalist Papers mention God, therefore, we're a Christian nation. Uh, Federalist Papers were a, ser a series of 85 essays written in 1787 and 1788. They were written by John Jay, who wrote the, fewest, the smallest number of them, James Madison, and most of them were written by Alexander Hamilton, who's now more famous than he used to be. <laughs> um, and their aim was to, to try to persuade the, state, the states to ratify the Constitution. So of the 85 Federalist Papers, I don't know how many pages that is, but I did find out that it takes 22 hours of reading in LibriVox, if you want to listen to them, if they're on LibriVox. Um, so it's a, it's a long, a lot of paper, paper, a lot of pages, a lot of words. The word God is used twice. <laughs> One of those is a reference to the pagan gods of ancient Greece. <laughs> the word Almighty is used twice, and Providence three times. The Bible is never quoted in the Federalist Papers. There are ten instances of the word religion in the Federalist Paper, and I, I put this one in, you can read it yourself. It's really bland and really not religious. It's, it's talking about um, a zeal for different opinions concerning religion. It, that was a concern of theirs, the zeal for different opinions concerning religion. So, you know, and one theory I have about the Founding Fathers is that some of them, when they use words like almighty, almighty or creator, these were sort of um, linguistic terms of phrase of that day. And, you know, some languages are more peppered with these types of phrases than others. Like in Spanish, you know, today there's ojalá que sí, which means God willing, Allah willing, and um, adios is to God, and other languages have similar things in them. I think English was more like that in 1776 than it is today. So, let's see. Uh, then we go to the Constitution itself. Um, if we look at Article 2, Section 1, um, the president, presidential oath of office, some people use this word oath and they think that oath means something religious. Um, and and the, the Constitution specifically says we don't have to swear, which might be a religious thing, we can affirm. And so the presidential oath of office, the president can affirm. And one of the reasons why this language was put in there was because of the Quakers. The Quakers objected to taking oath, and I made a little joke, friends don't let friends take oath. <laughs> <laughs> Does the president still say, so help me God? Yes. Yeah. 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 I think he has a choice. He can say it or not say it. But they still use the Bible. Or no. he doesn't have to. He could swear on a copy of the Constitution or, or the Federalist Papers. Yeah, SCARF recently uh, requested Donald Trump swear this original oath without for God and on the Constitution of the Bible. Mm -hmm. With the 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 deal. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump's going to take it on some gold plated. So, Article 6 of the Constitution. Uh, says, a very important one, no religious test shall ever be required as qualification to any office or public trust under the United, under the United States. Mm -hmm. Founding fathers were very clear that, you know, um, religion has no connection with the government. 
So moving on to the First Amendment, which is the main, oh, a few concluding remarks from that. I just want to read two paragraphs that I think are so well written from a thing called the Bad Idea Blog, which I found. It's anonymously published, so I don't know who wrote this, but this person says, if the founding was a fundamentally and distinctively Christian process, then the record should be saturated with biblical citations and debates and claimed insights at every turn. It's not. If the Bible was really the or even a major source of inspiration, then the different strains of Christian thought, interpretation, and moral theology held by the many and diverse founders should have clashed openly as the founders worked out these theological differences. There is no record of this, but not for lack of heated debate. Uh, there was a huge amount of heated debate. Simply for lack of anyone thinking that the Bible was relevant to those debates. This isn't to say that Christianity played no part in the culture, or even in the formation of many people's particular spin or value and morality, spin on value and morality. The vast majority of early Americans were religious. The deism of some of the founders has been overplayed by some <coughs> atheists. But the reality is still that none of the core philosophical and legal innovations of our nation have roots in the Bible. And few, if any, of the founding fathers thought that they did. Worse, many of these principles, such as religious liberty itself, are arguably, arguably but obviously anti-biblical. Our nation was and, as, and was seen by the founders as a worldly framework for the nation's worldly business. The matter of religion was seen as something that private citizens were more than capable of figuring out on their own. Uh, and I'll just say one more thing. I, th I think that some of the Founding Fathers became less religious as they aged. Uh, ben Franklin referred to himself in his autobiography as a deist. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to, James, to John Adams in 1823 in which he said, The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the supreme being in the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson and Thomas. John Adams. But we may hope that the dawn of reason and freedom of thought in these United States will do away with all this artificial scaffolding. Good luck. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. So I think it's helpful to, to actually read through the First Amendment, because um, not everybody memorizes it. Um, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So as far as religion goes in the First Amendment, there are two clauses the Establishment Clause, and the Free Exercise Clause. And as I was quoted in the uh, Monterey County Weekly, I think a lot of times what the religious right does is they take a free exercise, they take an Establishment Clause issue, like having the nativity scene on the uh, courthouse lawn or the town hall lawn, and they say, it's, it's a violation of my free exercise to not put that there. No, 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 it has nothing to do with free exercise. That's establishment. We're gonna go over some cases. So, but they, they try to confuse us about what's establishment and what's free exercise. Did you have a question? No, no okay. I was just scratching my ear. <laughs> okay. Um, so, it took a while for the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. I, I, so, I want to go back just a little bit to your, your, your comment about Jefferson. What was Adams' response? Because Adams was actually fairly religious, although he believed that you needed to have freedom of religion. I don't know what Adams' response was. Okay. You can look that up and get back to me later. <laughs> <laughs> so the United States Supreme Court didn't really get around to having any religion cases for quite a long time. The very first one that I know of was in 1878. And it's a free exercise case called Reynolds versus United States. What happened was there was a federal law that outlawed bigamy. And and maybe it was maybe it was targeted at Mormons. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the Supreme Court said, of course, the, the person who, the test case was in Utah, of course, right? Um, and the court said it's okay to outlaw bigamy because uh, we can outlaw something that most people think is immoral. Now, personally, I don't have a problem with bigamy, but, you know, but I'll say, you know, uh, Ben Franklin was, had a common law wife, and one of the reasons why she just was his common law wife was because uh, she was married to somebody else who had disappeared. And so they were never able to get married, and uh, they were very afraid to get married because in, this was in 1730, that they moved in together. 
Uh, the penalty at that time for bigamy in Pennsylvania was 39 lashes and life in prison. So bigamy was like considered a big crime back then. Um, let's see. So here's what the Supreme Court said. Back, wait a minute. They said, suppose one believed that human sacrifices were a necessary part of religious worship. Would it seriously be contended that the civil government under which he lived could not interfere to prevent a sacrifice? Or if a wife religiously believed it was her duty to burn herself on the funeral pile of her dead husband, would it be beyond the power of civil government to prevent her carrying her belief into practice? And I'll add, you know, maybe a modern possibility on this. What about female genital mutilation? Suppose we outlaw that and you say, but it's our religion. We, you know, circumcision is another thing. No. The, the Supreme Court, in my opinion, is not done with this issue at all. It's not completely settled. We're always going to be um, some new issues that are going to be coming up. But this case also um, reinforces that wall of separation theory. It, it references Thomas Jefferson's famous letter to the Danbury Baptist Association and which quotes, the, you know, that's where he used that term or that phrase, wall of separation between church and state, in that famous letter. And this, this court also um, said that Congress can't legislate opinion, so you can, you can hold any religious opinion that you want, but you can't necessarily act on it if there's a law against whatever it is. So, um, now fast forward again to 1947, I have a case called Everson versus Board of Education of Township of Ewing. And uh, this was the beginning of a long series of cases involving parochial schools and versus public schools. And in this, this is the first one. New Jersey decided to pay for bus transportation for school children, all school children, on public buses, including the kids who went to Catholic school. And somebody sued. And, um, I'll take those. So the... <laughs> Court held, the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be held, kept high and impregnable. We would not approve the slightest breach. New Jersey has not breached it here. And the, the, uh, the reasoning was that the busing kids to parochial school didn't aid religion. It just aided kids getting to school. And so it, it treated all the kids equally, so that was okay. Um, this case also said, How's my time doing, Susan? You're okay. Okay. This case also said, the establishment of religion clause of the First Amendment means at least this. Neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church. Neither can pass laws which aid one religion, aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another. Neither can force nor influence a person to go or to remain away from church against his will, or force him to profess a belief or a disbelief in any religion. No person can be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs, for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they may be called or whatever form they may adopt, to teach or practice religion. Neither a state nor a federal government can openly or secretly participate in the affairs of any religious organizations or groups, and vice versa. In the words of Jefferson, the clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. Whatever David Barton says. Was that from that Everson case? Yes. I was just quoting that. That whole thing I just said was, was quoting from Everson. And, um, and also, um, another quote from this case. These words of the First Amendment reflected in the minds of early Americans a vivid, mental picture of conditions and practices which they fervently wished to stamp out in order to preserve liberty for themselves and for their posterity. Doubtless their goal has not been entirely reached, but so far the nation moved toward it in that expression, law respecting an establishment of religion probably does not so vividly remind present day Americans of the evils, fears, and political problems that caused that expression to be written into our Bill of Rights. So, another case uh, in, from 1961, McGowan versus Maryland, um, is a Sunday closing law constitutional. 
And in other words, is that establishment? If I say, you have to close, you can't sell beer on Sundays, because you just can't, is that establishment? I can't say I agree with this decision. The court said no. It said, uh, although Sunday happens to coincide with Christian Sabbath, a, a day of rest, oh. is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> and boiling down a Supreme Court case to one sentence is not easy. Engel <laughs> um, versus Vitale, 1962. A public school district wanted the kids to recite a prayer every morning. Can't do it. That's establishment. <laughs> Waltz versus Tax Commission of the City of New York, 1970. Property tax exemptions for churches. This is a big one. Is that establishment? Um, don't really agree with this one either. But no, because these groups have beneficial and stabilizing influences in community life. And because we have a lengthy tradition in our country of benevolent neutrality toward churches and religion in general. But I like this quote a lot, the best quote. The court has struggled to find a neutral course between the two religion clauses, both of which are cast in absolute terms, and either of which is expanded to a logical extreme with the clash with the other. So we're still, the court is still threading this fine line between establishment and free exercise, and will continue to do so. I think there's going to be a lot of cases like this coming up, maybe even more under a Trump administration. And, depending on what happens with the Supreme Court. Okay, so this is one of the most famous Supreme Court cases, and I, I must thank this case for me passing the bar exam. <laughs> <laughs> the Lament House case of my bar exam, and I heard some girls in the bathroom afterward um, saying what they wrote about this question, and I was like, no. <laughs> no, honey, you missed it. Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, this is another case about state aid to parochial schools, and um, so I just set up a, a, a test. It is, is it establishment? Is it or is it not establishment? So three-prong test, is there a, a secular purpose to the law? It, does the primary effect of the law not advance or inhibit religion? And does it not result in excessive government entanglement with religious affairs? Now, there's been uh, other establishment clause cases that have modified this test and changed it around, but this is still kind of the gist of, of establishment, the lemon test. Um, there was another case in 1980 that said no Ten Commandments in the public schools, but that's about the end of my establishment clause um, cases. Now we're going to move on to free exercise. How much time do I have? Um, this is my least favorite Supreme Court case ever, uh, besides <laughs> Citizens United, but that's not. <laughs> um, Wisconsin versus Yoder uh, in 1972 um, said that, that the Amish could, self, could educate their own kids, and they didn't have to go to public school. Um, and this case kind of gave license to the religious right to start this whole homeschooling movement and um, take their kids out of public school and isolate them from the world. And I, I hope this case will be overturned. I think it would be a whole lot better if everybody had to go to school until they were 18. Anyway, um, here's a famous one. Um, this is a case where uh, some Native Americans got fired for using peyote. And the question was, can I is it free exercise? I mean, it's a big religious tradition in the tribe. Can I use peyote and not get fired from my job for using peyote? Um, and Justice Scalia wrote the um, decision on this, and he kind of painted himself into a little bit of a corner because he said, no, you can't carve out a free exercise exception to a law like this. Uh, the law stands, you know, no peyote. So uh, in response to that case, we got the Religious Freedom Restoration Act later, and I'll get to that. Um, let's see, oh, another one of my favorite Supreme Court cases is the 1993 case, so this is 1990, 
1993, there's a case called the Church of Lukumi Babalu Aye versus the city of Hialeah, Florida. <laughs> so this was a group of uh, probably Haitian people who wanted to uh, practice Santeria, their religion, and they wanted to sacrifice live chickens in church. And, um, and the city council of, of Hialeah, Florida was just out to get these people. They, they kind of, they gerrymandered, the, the court used the word gerrymandered with care, this ordinance to try to get these people to stop doing this. And the government said, no, no, we need to apply strict scrutiny here, which means that the ordinance must be the least restrictive means of advancing a compelling government interest. Go ahead and sacrifice your chickens. Got a question? Yes. Isn't Santeria, or however you say it, a form of voodoo? And wouldn't they be like trying to stop that religion? Yes. Because it's satanic or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted to stamp out that religion. But they didn't right. want that religion around because it wasn't a Christian. Yeah, there right. was a similar case in Santa Fe that just happened with the people uh, importing ayahuasca from Brazil oh, to yeah. use ceremony. And yeah. the argument they used there and for the county zoning was that they would have to put the uh, human waste into a septic system and then it would eventually pollute the groundwater. <laughs> and they lost. They ended up paying about eight hundred thousand dollars in legal fees plus some of the construction costs. <laughs> Um, so, so then we got the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I'm not sure I completely understand that, but, but when I first heard about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, I thought, oh, this is another plot by the religious right. But no, it was, it was introduced by Chuck Schumer, who was not only not Christian, but he's a left-wing Democrat. So, but that was, that was also a double-edged sword, because the RIFRA begat the Hobby Lobby decision from two years ago, where the court said a... Uh, only a closely held corporation, a private company, can carve out this religious exception. I disagree with that decision. But uh, in June of this year, this is the last case I'm going to talk about, in June of this year, there's a case that the United States Supreme Court declined to hear. It's called Stormans Inc. versus Weissman or Weissman. Um, and this is not brought under the RUFRA, but the a state law in Washington State. And again, it's one of these pharmacy cases where a pharmacist doesn't want to prescribe birth control. And um, the Ninth Circuit said, no, you know, the law is good. You have to do, you have to follow the law. The United States Supreme Court declined to hear this case just in June. So I think there are probably going to be other similar cases coming down the pike. I think they're, they're brewing. So anyway, that's it. What are my closing remarks? <laughs> Our founding fathers feared the danger of mixing religion and politics. And we forget that lesson at our great peril. If we forget, just glance over to the Middle East. Um, when we mix religion and politics, we get conflict, possibly war, and bad thing. <laughs> Thank you. How do we get you onto the Supreme Court? I dominate the big Trump in 2020. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Well, I would vote for Barack Obama. Well, Schumer wants to block any Supreme Court nominations. For four years. Oh. <laughs> All right, so we are really running down to the end. You guys have uh, been fantastic, and the speakers have been fantastic. I have uh, a very quick thing that I'm going to do really quick before we do our last break. Um, after our break, we're going to come back, and we're going to have two more lectures, and then we are done. If you would like to support Monterey County Skeptics, please, we, we have a, a bill of $1,200 we need to make, and we appreciate any donations you can make if you want to. We have, I want to see anybody here know what this is. What does that say? Happy what? Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. How many doctors? Two. Which is another word you can use is a... Paradox. Birthday paradox. Okay. So I'm going to do a birthday paradox really quick and I have a prize. And I have a prize for everyone actually. So I just want to let you know. So some people may like math. Skeptics do like math, but from what I understand. And by, if you had a group of people in a room, how many people would you have to have in a room to pretty much guarantee 100% that two people in the room are going to have the same birthday. And that's, that's, not the, that's the first question, but I don't have a price for that one. So if 100 people are in uh, if you want.
100% more or less accuracy that two people in the room are going to have the same birthday. Any Anybody have a guess of what it is? 100% I know it wasn't Well, 99.9. .9. I mean, maybe 30. 23. 363. 363. But actually, to guarantee a 99.9% .9 according to Wikipedia, you need 70 people in the room. So, my question, and I have a prize for whoever has the right answer, I have a little little Darwin uh, thing, is um, how many people would you need in a room to guarantee 50% chance that two people will share the same birthday? And uh, nobody's Googling this, I hope. 24. 22. 28. 30. 30. 30. 30. Wait, 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 I heard it. I heard it. 23. I heard it just a second ago. 37. Oh my God, I should have done this differently. Okay, one more time. You guys get one vote. So what do you guys say clearly? 60. 29. 26. 24. 17. 20. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. 35. I bring this up is because we do have at least two people in this room who have the same birthday, and that's Arlen, who's one of our quote, our quoters, and Jan, who went to the paranormal prison. And I don't know, is there anybody else in the room that's celebrating a birthday today, January 7th? Sterling's birthday's in two days, so if I want to just crowd that in, I will go ahead and crowd it in and say that uh, there. So what we do is we have, uh, you have a birthday? No, I'm just wondering why. It's math. Statistics. <laughs> It, it's, it's because of society and, and the way in berries and um, people live under the world and strawberries, I think. So we have some cake for you all, chocolate cake in the other room if you want to go and help yourself to a small piece. I'd like you to be back in 10 minutes. So go for it. I guess I can turn this off.